so this video is partly in response to some questions you asked in the reading questions, things you wanted me to talk about more. Um, and then me being me, I expanded way past the simple question you asked, but hopefully it will illuminate you. Now, we're going to talk about how to find, what does it mean, and how does it find a principal axis of a body. Now, the principal axis should not be confused with a principal axis, right? A principal axis is an axis of a body such that if it is rotating around that axis, its angular momentum vector will also point along that axis, right? We saw that in general, a body rotating around some axis, the angular momentum vector might actually point in a different direction, which is boggling but true. If it's rotating around a principal axis, then it's... Um, uh, then its angular momentum and its angular velocity vectors point in the same direction. In contrast, a principal axis is something like a moral compass, I think. And so this needs to enter your lexicon. Um, when you talk about your moral compass, you can also talk about your principal axis. But that's not the topic for today. Today, I want to talk about a principal axis. All right. Notes. In general, we have uh, this. Right, the angular momentum is equal to the moment of inertia tensor matrix product, right, which I write as a dot here, dot omega. Uh, okay, that's that's always true if you've done your moment of inertia tensor right. But if if omega is along a principal axis, and I'm going to write prink period axis so that you can think maybe it's actually a moral compass. If that is true, then we also have lambda L is equal to lambda times omega, where lambda is just a scalar. And this is what you would have called a moment of inertia. Right, back in the old days, when you made sure that you were rotating, um, that closed parenthesis should have been a closed quote, when you were making sure that you were always rotating around a principal axis, this lambda would be called a moment of inertia. Well, let's put these two equations together. I have I matrix, you know, tensor, but it's a matrix. Matrix product with the omega vector is equal to scalar times the omega vector. Those of you who have taken linear algebra will recognize this as the eigenvalue equation. Right, and it turns out there's all uh, there's theorems and things in linear algebra that says that if you have a three by three matrix, you will have three different eigenvalues. That's not right. You will have three eigenvalues. Sometimes they're the same eigenvalue. Sometimes you have the same eigenvalue multiple times. Um, the most obvious case is the identity matrix. Right, the identity matrix is one zero 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 one zero 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 one. Um, what's its eigenvalue? one because that matrix times any vector is equal to one times any vector and then it turns out right that any vector is an eigenvector because this equation will be satisfied here for any vector for the identity matrix which sadly we use i for and now we're using i for moment of inertia but or, sorry inertia tensor but whatever um, okay but what this means though is that for any old matrix if i can find its eigenvalues and its eigenvectors, so this is called an eigen, this is the eigenvalue equation. What you do is you figure out, find the omegas and the lambdas such that this equation is satisfied. So this won't work for any old omega, necessarily. Again, for the identity matrix it does. But it won't work for any old lambda, and it won't, in general, work for any old omega. So you have to figure out what are the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And how do you actually do that? You take linear algebra, and you learn how to do it. But I'm going to show you another way to do it. Um, for people like me who uh, prefer to have computers do everything for them. So um, if you can find the omegas, then those omegas are in the direction of the principal axes. That's how you figure out what the principal axes are. And then um, the lambdas, the lambda that goes with an omega is the moment of inertia about that principal axis. All right, so let's um, do an example. Um, to see how you figure this out. So here's the example I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to have the x-axis and the z-axis. X, z. And then I'm going to have two masses, which for now I'm going to make identical. There's one mass. Here's another mass. They're connected by extremely lightweight rods. Um, right? You could do this for 
for anything, but I want to make it where it's easy to calculate the tensor. Um, I'm still going to use maxima to do it, but I want to make it easy to calculate it. All right, I'm going to, to keep life easy. I'm going to make both of those angles 45 degrees, but of course radians are better than degrees, so I'm going to write it as pi over 4. I'm going to call this length L and this length L over 2. And both particles have mass M, right? And so now... Um, I can figure out what the moment of inertia tensor is. Now first, just to make sure that we know what we're talking about, the, dis the, the position of R1, the displacement of R1 from the origin, let's call this particle 1 and this particle 2, um, just so 1's in the positive x-axis, I don't know why, is going to be equal to L, and then if that's an angle there, the x component of particle 1 is the sine, so it's going to be sine pi over 4, There's, nothing's on y, and then cosine pi over 4, and the sine and cosine of pi over 4 is just 1 over the square root of 2. So those of you who've had modern and quantum might say, wait a minute, eigenvalues, where have I heard that before? Yep, treat the matrix as an operator. These are the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the operator. Same thing, right? Linear algebra, useful little thing. So that's R1. That's the position of particle 1. And position of particle 2 is L over 2 times minus sine, right? Because it's, it's on the negative x direction, 0, but it has positive z there, cosine pi over 4. So this is going to be L over 2 root 2, 0, L over 2 root 2, right? Those are the positions. And now I can use this in, um, like for example, to get I, Z, Z. Oop, I just moved back to Canada briefly. Um, I'm going to use the sum of M alpha times x alpha squared plus y alpha squared. Well, now this is just going to be a two element sum because I have r1 and r2. So I'll use x1, y1, and m1, and then the m's are the same. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. So I've got this maxima file here, and I will put this maxima file online for you uh, so that you can download it later and see what its deal is. Um, so I start, I'm going to load the vect and eigen packages because those turns out to be very useful things. And now I'm going to just put R1 and R2 in here. Now there's a whole comment here that I'll leave there you can read later. For this matrix multiplication stuff, I want R1 to be a column vector. So I'm not going to just enter it as three values in brackets, which is what you often do just for a you know, vector. Oh, it's a list of three values. I want to make it a column vector. Well, so matrix is a function that creates a matrix. Each, and it takes multiple arguments, each argument of matrix Right, so here, matrix has three arguments. The first is L over square root 2 in brackets. The second is 0 in brackets. And the third is L over square root 2 in brackets. So each argument to the function matrix is one row of the matrix. And then um, you pass it as a list. And then inside that list, you have all the columns. But there's only one column for each row here. So we'll see a longer one later. So that's R1, and then here's R2, right? So you notice it's 1 over 2 root 2, and then there's negative on the first thing. Okay, now, I want to get LXX, so on and so forth, and here's another thing. Because these column vectors are represented as 3 by 1 matrices, to pull out just the component, you actually need two indexes, the row and the column. So here, if you look at down here where I'm doing LXX, so remember, LXX is supposed to be the sum of M times X squared plus, sorry, not X squared, M times Y squared plus Z squared. Well, so here's R1, the second row, first column of R1, that's the Y component of that column vector. Third row, first column. So that's Y1 squared plus Z1 squared, Y2 squared plus Z2 squared. I factored out the M because it's the same for both. All right, so that's LXX, and LXX works out to be uh, 5 eighths ML squared. Um, except that maxima has its own idea about what order it should write things in. So I'll do the same for LYY, LZZ. And now we have the products of inertia. So remember, LXY is the sum of M times minus XY. So for R1, I have 1, 1 is the first row, first column. So that's the X component. Second row, first column, that's the Y component. So this is minus um, X1, Y1, and then minus X2, Y2. So that'll give me... Uh, LXY, hey, it's zero, LXZ, oop, not zero, and then LXY. Okay, so now I want to have the full-on moment of inertia tensor, and that's just, I've just put in the components here. Now, notice here, 
um, instead of here putting LYX, which is what you would normally do, I've used the fact that the tensor is symmetric and just put in IX. That's not an L. This is a, this is, these are, all right. All those L's, I do these fonts. Um, like, look at this. That's, uh, that's capital I, that's lowercase L. How can you tell which is which? You can't. It's a disaster. So all that time I was saying L up there, I really meant I because these are the components of the moment of inertia tensor. So I'm saying I is matrix. And right here's the first row. And those are the three columns. Second row, those are the three columns, so on and so forth. So I do this and boom, there's the matrix. So that's the moment of inertia tensor for this little setup of these two masses here. It is not a diagonal tensor, which means the X, Y, and Z axes are not necessarily the principal axes. So you see here, I have a comment. I'm pretty sure one of the principal axes is going to be the Y axis. And I'll tell you why in a little bit. Um, part of it is looking at the matrix and these zeros here tell me, hmm, I bet Y is a principal axis. Um, but given this is not diagonal, then if Y is principal, X and Z can't be principal. So how do I find it? Find the eigenvectors. And here's the thing that would be hard and long, but instead we just make Maxima do it for us. So in the eigen package, and I'll put a link to the documentation to that specific package, but you can find it. There are things like EIVEX, which gives you the eigenvectors. Um, UEIVEX actually are the unit eigenvectors. If you think about it, if you have an eigenvector and you multiply that eigenvector by a constant, it will still satisfy the eigenvector equation because you just have the same constant on both sides of the equation. So I've decided I want the unit vectors. And so that's what this U does. And so I hit this res and oh my goodness, this big long mess comes out. This, all these brackets tell you, oh my have I have a list of a list of a list. And then notice I close the two brackets and then here is still inside the first bracket. So I have a list of a list of a list of a list and you start to feel overwhelmed. So what you have to do is slow down and just think, oh, okay, okay, well, go look at the documentation, what's going on. I tell you what all of it is here, but basically um, these are the three eigenvalues. These are the multiplicities of the eigenvalues. So if there had been an eigenvalue that was the same for different eigenvectors, it would have only shown up. Um, I think once, and then there would have been a two here or something like that. I believe I'll have to do an example sometime to make sure. So if you look at this, it's the first element of the first element of the first element it gives you the first eigenvalue, right? Well, so first I pull out the multiplicities. So notice on the outside list, um, there is uh, th this thing is the eigen uh, vector, and then this second list is the multiplicities. So of the first of the outside list is all eigenvalue stuff. Sorry, I lied to you. These are the eigenvalues, right? So you have a list, the outer list, first eigenvalues, second eigenvector. So now this list, eigenvalue information. First, list of eigenvalues, second list of multiplicities. So here are the multiplicities. I pull them out. Oh, look, it's one, one, one. So now if I want to get out the eigenvectors, well, so the first, the outside list, the first element is vector or sorry, value information, right? So the second thing is um, a list of two things where the first is the values, the second is the multiplicity. So then in here I have the three values. So I have to do one, one, one will give me, so these will pull out the three eigenvalues and there they are. Um, you'll notice if I scroll back up here, L, um, 1 8th ML squared, 9 8 ML squared, 5 4 ML squared. Those are what I got for the three eigenvalues. Those are also the moments of inertia along the three principal axes. So that's how you can pull those out. Now I want to pull out the eigenvectors. So if you look up here, so first of all, outer list, the first element, which is all this stuff, is eigenvalue information. The second is eigenvector information. That's all that stuff. And now there's a list of list of lists again. And it's like, why, 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 whatever. Anyway, you notice I have to go in and then one time, right? So this, I don't even know why that's a list there. I'm sure there's a really good reason for it. Um, and then this is the list of eigenvectors. And each eigenvector is a list because it has three components, right? So if I go in two, one, one, that will pull out the first eigenvector. Um, but notice it gives me as a list. And remember, I want a column vectors uh, rather than lists so I can just work with these vectors. So I do this same matrix thing and you notice now there's four indices and that's because I'm pulling out the X, Y, and Z components here. Boom. And there I have it as a column vector. So that's one principal axis. Here's the next principal axis. 
And here's the third principal axis. Hey, look, the third principal axis is the y-axis. So I was right in um, guessing that the y-axis was a principal axis. But, you know, if you go up here and you look at these, hey, wait a minute, that's just at a 45-degree angle between x and z. And that's a 45-degree angle between x and minus z. Um, so what that tells me is, oh, wait, I should have been able to guess those principal axes. What are they? Right, so this is the situation we were dealing with, two point masses, 45 degree angles. The things holding the point masses onto the origin here are extremely light, so we ignored them. Their mass was not significant. And if you look at, so one of the principal axes was the y-axis. The other two, well, one was oriented at a 45 degree angle between the x and z axis, so that's one of them. And the other was at a 45 degree angle between the x and minus z axis. That's the other one. Now, notice it could just as well have given me um, uh, this one, it would have been exactly the same thing, just negative, and that's because really it defines an axis to rotate about, so the direction of the vector is not that important. But if I look at this, I realize, oh, I should have figured out that those were going to be the principal axes, because what are they? Uh, well, this principal axis is the case where this mass is just on the axis, so when the thing is rotating, that mass doesn't contribute to the angular momentum at all, um, and then that's, uh, you know, so, huh, all right, and then this thing is just kind of off at a straight line. This guy is off at a straight line like that. Um, and then the other one is the other way around. And realizing, just kind of looking at that, I'm thinking, oh, I probably should have guessed that those were going to be the principal axes, since these two guys were at a 90-degree angle with respect to each other. So um, when you find something and you realize that the answer is maybe not all that hard, what you should immediately do is try and do something harder. All right, that's how you should approach life. So instead now, I want to do this. So I'm going to have uh, x and y, y, x, draw the rest of x, sorry, x and z, y is into the page. I'm going to put a mass here, whoop, and I'm going to put another mass here, but I'm going to make it more general now so that it's harder. I'm going to define this angle as theta. I'm going to define that angle as alpha, So and then I just won't make alpha 90 degrees this time. So alpha is going to be some angle. Um, that's theta. I will call this beta, but of course beta is just equal to alpha minus theta. And notice the direction I gave for beta there. I did that on purpose. I'm going to call this L1. I'm going to call this L2. I'm going to call this M1, and I'm going to call this M2. Right. So I've, gone, I've got a much more general, not completely general, uh, but a much more general um, setup of these two masses. And then the one other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to let me change the orientation by phi around the z-axis so they might be a long y. They're still on a plane with each other. I guess they have to be, right? If you just have two masses, um, you can connect two masses with a line, and it's got to be in a plane. That and uh, the z-axis, the three of them, will have to make a plane. No, that's not right. I could easily have two masses that aren't in a plane with the z-axis. So ignore what I just said. But they still do have to be on a plane with each other, right? Because... Uh, this point, the origin in the two masses, um, would make a plane. But So this is not general. I, I could also add another angle to tilt this that I haven't added here. Now, I do want to step aside for a moment and say, when would you actually use this? Because notice that the origin, which is the point about which I'm calculating the moment of inertia here, is not, absolutely not, the center of mass of these two things, right? The center of mass of these two things is probably going to be somewhere like here. It depends on what m1 and m2 are relative to each other. So the center of mass and the origin are different spots. If, um, instead of this setup, I just had these two masses like this connected by a light rod, right, with their center of mass here or something like that, and I tossed it in the air, it would rotate about its center of mass, right? So this is where you use the... Um, uh, F equals ma, and you can figure out the motion of the center of mass, and then you have rotation about the center of mass. So, and the moment of inertia tensor I get there would be very different than the moment of inertia tensor I'm going to get here. So why would I ever do this? Why didn't I make the origin at the center of mass? Well, the setup might be is to suppose that the origin point is fixed. Um, so how would you actually build this? Get a couple of very lightweight wires, like hanger wires, um, like hangers. So stiff wires, and then put blobs of putty at the end to make your masses, um, and then stick it, um, fix this point right here. This would actually be easier to imagine hanging from the ceiling, because you could just um, hang a thread, although then with a the thread it could oscillate like a pendulum, but whatever, fix it 
really just fix it with a universal joint that's frictionless so that it can freely rotate around this point, but that point has to stay in the same place at all times, right? So these are the two cases Taylor was talking about where you might want to use this, right? This, I think, was his first case. This was his second case. Um, the second case is not more general. Somebody asked about that. No, they're just different cases. The second case is an object rotating about its center of mass, which is what objects that are freely flying around are going to do. The first case is an object that has one fixed point. Um, so there's a, an additional constraint in there that one point is fixed in place. When you have a fixed point, it makes sense to calculate rotations about that fixed point because that fixed point is going to be the one that stays in place, right? All right, so that's what we're doing here. Um, now, just to make sure we know what our, our various R vectors are, let me make myself some space again. And um, my various R vectors um, R1, oh, I keep doing that. Keep forgetting to go back to small. R1, in this case, well, it's spherical coordinates, right? So I can just do L1 sine theta cosine phi, right? So if you imagine that theta was zero, then R, uh, R1 would have no x or y components. Sine theta sine phi cosine theta, right? That's what that's what R1 is. And L1, it's length. And those it's just standard x, y, z and spherical coordinates. Um, R2, same thing, except I have to be a little bit careful. It's minus sine beta cosine phi. And why is that? It's because I'm using the same phi for both masses. But notice that M2 is 180 degrees away from M1. So really, I should be using phi plus pi over 2. And that's going to pull out a negative sign here. Uh, just the way that I've set this thing up. So then y is minus sine beta sine phi, and z will be cosine beta. Whoop, whoop. I didn't really get that. So that's what R, R1 and R2 are. And so now let's go ahead and figure out the moment of it. And I'm actually, well, you'll see. It's going to be kind of terrible. But we're going to figure out the moment with two masses. It can be terrible already with just two masses. But we're going to figure out the moment of inertia of this thing here. All right, I don't want this table of contents here. So view, table of contents, gone. All right. Okay, as before, load the Vectin eigen packages. Here's R1, here's R2. You can go back and look to make sure I got R1 and R2 right. Negative signs on R2. Should be the same as what I drew. Now, I'm going to enter the various products of inertia. Now, <laughs> warning, when I did this the first time, you'll see a check I do at the end. Um, the check didn't work. And I'm like, what's going wrong? And I eventually discovered that this three here had been a two. And it was supposed to be a three. So the warning is it's really easy to make mistakes like that. And it's not easy to see them. So you have to be really slow and resolute when you're proofreading. And you go back and really make sure everything is right. A quick glance just will not do it. So I'll get my products of inertia here. And I mean, look at them, right? They're all like multiple term things. So let's go ahead and assemble them into a big matrix, which is going to be Brobdingnagian. Dagnian, or Nagnian. I don't know if I spelled that right. You should look it up and find out. Um, boom, there it is. And right, I have to scroll over to see the whole thing. That's really long, right? Now, I what I did next is I said, hey, Maxima, tell me the eigenvectors of that. And Maxima was working and working and working. And eventually, I got bored and gave up. Uh, it might have finished eventually, but <laughs> it's long. So here's what I'm going to do is I'm actually not going to... Um, I'm not going to do the general case. Let's pick a specific case. So what I'm going to do down here, I'm going to make I num. So it's going to be a numerical moment of inertia tensor. I'm going to substitute in one kilogram for mass, one meter for the length of one. And actually, both masses were the same here. It's a little less general than what I just did when I was writing. Length one is one meter. Length two is 0.6 meters. Notice I didn't have beta, or I didn't have alpha above. So I'm going to substitute beta to alpha minus theta so that now I can substitute theta and alpha. I make theta 20 degrees. I convert to radians because that's what you need in maxima. I make alpha 60 degrees. So that's the angle between the two masses. It was 90 in the previous example. I want to make it different now. now. Let's make phi zero so it's still in the x z plane. So boom, I substitute that in. OK, now this tensor you can look at. It's just numbers. It's in units of meters, sorry, kilograms times meters squared. Notice that these off-axis y components are zero, so you expect y to still be a principal axis. Let's find them. Get the eigenvectors and eigenvalues, and boom, there it is. Now, another warning here. Uh, 
when I first did this, uh, first first did this before the last time I said I first did it, I was using um, Maxima version 5.38. Now, if you look at the top of the screen here, it says WX Maxima 20.03.1. WX Maxima is just a front end to Maxima. So you can have different versions of Maxima with the same WX Maxima, right? So this is the version of WX Maxima, which is the graphical user interface. Maxima is the back end. How do I know what it is? Go to help and then load about here. And then you won't see this because it's not on the same window, but you can look through and see what versions of things. And you look for the version of Maxima um, and it'll tell you what version. So I'm on 5.43 now. When I did this with 5.38, it refused to give me a couple of the eigenvectors, which made me very sad. So I compiled Maxima 5.43. Um, and, and there it is. So there are my eigenvectors as before. Let's pull out the multiplicities. Hey, look, there's three different eigenvectors. Let's pull out the eigenvectors. Again, I use the same technique that I used in the previous Maxima file. There they are. Those are the three moments of inertia in units of kilogram times meter squared. So let's get our principal axes. Boom. And these are unit vectors because I did U I vex. Right. So there they are. So once again, the Y axis is a principal axis. Um, here are the other two principal axes. Okay, well, I'm going to draw this in a bit so we can visualize it. Um, I'm just going to do the check here. Um, so again, in Maxima, I write one thing equals another thing. That doesn't mean it really is equals, right? So I could write one equals two, and Maxima will happily say, okay, that's what you said. That's what I'm going to say. Um, but here, if I do this, you will notice um, visually comparing these two things, you'll see they're the same. Now, I need to give you another warning here, because once you do floating point numbers, precision is an issue, right? They're the same, but look at the last digit. Here's a three versus a one. So Maxima won't think they're the same. Here's the thing you can do in Maxima. I can say is one equals two. It'll say false. I can see one equals one. It'll say true, right? So is checks whether the statement is true. If I say, uh, let's do this one again. If I say is of that, it'll say false because it notices this last digit is different. But that's when you use floating point calculations, you have round off error that's going to hit your last couple of digits. Um, so really, you know, you can look at these and say, yeah, okay, they're the same as each other. Now, I was interested, what is the angle between these if I wanted to draw these on the XZ plane? Um, and these numbers here were wrong. Let's take these numbers out. So what I just did is I said, oh, I want to figure out what they are. So I'm going to cut and paste Z divided by X, and that'll give me what angle I would draw the things at. This would be if I wanted to, say, render it in Blender and rotate by an angle. Um, that's what it is. Um, or 80 degrees. Well, okay, interesting. What does that mean? I don't know. We'll look in a little bit. I'm not going to do the other one. You, it's exercise for the reader. Okay, so now I want to I want to draw this. So I'm going to load the draw package. Now, I'm going to need numerical versions of R1 and R2. So I do exactly the same substitution. I just cut and paste it, in fact, that I did in the tensor to get numerical values of R1 and R2. Uh, okay. And now I'm going to define some graphic objects to send to, um, to, to draw. I'm going to call a draw function. Now, you've always done draw, open parenthesis, explicit, open parenthesis, like f of x comma x comma x zero comma x one. You've done that kind of thing before. Well, explicit inside created a graphic object that you passed to draw. You could have made one ahead of time. So I'm just making, I'm going to make a line that's from the origin to where mass one is. I'm going to make a point that is just at mass one. I'm going to make a line from the origin to where mass two is, a point that's at mass two. I'm going to make a line for the first principal axis, a line for the second principal axis, and now I'm going to draw all this. I start with proportional axes equals x, y, so that it won't stretch them wrong. Um, I turn my color to blue. I'm going to plot my two lines. I turn my point size to filled, filled circle, point size to four. I plot my two points. Then I'm going to change my color to red, and I'll pull out the two principal axes in red. So we draw that, and here's the plot we get. So remember this here thing we figured was it like 80 degrees or something, 88. I don't remember whatever the number was. All right. So here's my two little guys. All right. These are my two masses. So these are the wires connecting the masses. It's telling me these are the principal axes. Uh, okay. I don't. Do I believe that? I don't know. I mean, it seems a little weird to me that, you know, this distance and this distance would happen to work out right if you're rotating around that, that axis. I guess I'm surprised, but we're not rotating around this axis. We're rotating around this point, right? So rotating around this point, is this axis one of the ones that works out? Well, here's how you can decide. 
what you want to do is let's assume it's rotating around this axis. We're going to make omega along this axis. And we want to figure out what's the angular momentum. Well, remember, angular momentum is just r cross p, where r is the displacement from the point you're calculating about to where the object is. So I need the momentum of this guy, and I could do r cross its mv. and do r cross this one's mv, right? And then I can add them up and get the total angular momentum and see if it's in the same direction as this. How do I get the v? Remember, v is omega cross r. We used that before. So I'll take this omega, and I'll cross it with this r. So here's where I do this. Now, here's an annoying thing that there may be a way around this, but I don't know. This twiddle vector does cross products in maxima. But if you just do it, it will just return it to you. So you have to do express to actually have it calculate the cross product. I don't really know why. Next, this twiddle operator comes from the vect package, not the eigen package. So it wants a list, not a column vector. So it's irritating. So this list matrix entries will turn this column vector into a list. So this is just, I have to do this to cross product these two. So notice principal axis one, I'm saying that's what omega is along. So omega cross R1, right? R1 is from here to here. That's principal axis one. So omega cross R1, that's going to give me V1. Um, so if you look at that, you'll notice that it's in the, um, let's see, omega cross R that is into the page, which is what you would expect if it's rotating around that axis. So, okay, good. And then here's V2, and you'll say, oh, look, it's out of the page. So now that I have those, I can do R cross V, M is one. So I'll just do R cross V instead of R cross P. So that's the angular momentum of the first guy, the farther guy, that's the angular momentum of the closer guy. That's the total angular momentum. Now, this is not a unit vector. The, you can just tell this by inspection that this has a length less than one. To compare it to principal axis one, I actually want to get the unit vector, which you know how to calculate that. But, oh, look, Maxima has a stupid little function that'll do it for me. And it explains me stuff that I ignore. There's my unit vector. That is the direction of the angular momentum. Remember the angular velocity was along the principal axis. Hey, look, they're the same. So it really worked. If I scroll back up, you know, it's not obvious to me that this would have been the principal axis and this would have been the principal axis, but they are. So again, this would be a case where um, like this is a fixed point. It's a universal joint or it's like a top where there's a little divot in the table. So this thing can't move away from here. So it's rotating around this point. If it's rotating along this axis, it'll keep rotating along that axis. Um, then the angular momentum and the thing is the same. If it's not rotating along this axis, it won't, and the whole thing will kind of process in interesting ways that we will talk about later in this chapter when we talk about um, precession and rotation and all that kind of neat stuff. Right? So any collection of points, meaning any object, has principal axes. That's what I talked about earlier with eigenvalues and all of that. Um, if you have a lot of symmetry, the principal axes are going to be the axes about which you have symmetry. So a cylinder, the axis of the cylinder will be one of your principal axes. Um, but if you don't have a lot of symmetry, it's not necessarily obvious what the principal axes are, but they're there. There will be three principal axes that um, if you rotate around that axis, the angular momentum will be in the same direction. Right? For this collection, these two point masses here, fixed to rotate around this point, these are the principal axes. The principal axes around the center of mass would have been very different. In fact, this would have been one of them, and then any two perpendicular to that would have been the other two. I don't actually know. I've been pointing with this all along, and I actually don't know if you can see my arrow. So I hope you can. If not, uh, I might have to re-record this whole thing. All right, that's all for today.